Let's open with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. He said, give him the signal when and I had given it to him and he's asleep at the switch over there. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, I'm glad to see you guys here this morning. How many of you have meditated this, that, the thing this morning? Okay. How many of you meditate regularly? So you look at you. Uh, when I came in to AA, well, you can't say you didn't believe in prayer. I know people pray, but I didn't. And uh, I did not believe that the Creator interceded in the circumstances and events of the universe because of human problems or human prayers or pleas. And, uh, but I didn't say much about it. I was just thinking I was barely getting in here anyway. And uh, I, I wanted to stay in AA. And, and uh, uh, I, uh, I did tell my sponsor... I said, I'll hold you. I'm not going to make a big spectacle of this. I'll hold your hand and I'll say the Lord's Prayer with you. But, uh, I, and I will get it right. It's in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, at least in my Bible, it's in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, that's from the, directly from the Bible Belt. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, he didn't seem to care. The next time we held hands, I heard him say, on earth as it is in heaven. And I was saying, in earth. But uh, <laughs> uh, other than that, I, I didn't believe in prayer and I didn't believe that God interceded. And uh, I, my life got better. I went through the step, you know, and as I said in my talk, I... I did the first half of the first step, skipped the second half, skipped the second step, and the third step, did a terrific, really, fourth, fifth, and uh, eighth and ninth step. And, uh, and it, you know, half measures avail you something. I can't help it, Bill. Uh, <laughs> half measures availed me a lot. It really changed my life. And, uh, uh, or at least, when I say a lot, if you guys knew me when I came in to AA, and if you really knew me now, you would say, Howard is a completely different person. The old Howard died, and there's a new Howard. It's completely different. Now, if you would compare me today to, say, Mother Teresa... You would say, well, Howard hasn't changed much. He's, you know, I, <laughs> I'm a long ways from sainthood. But, but, uh, and that started happening immediately. And something happened to me when I was about a year sober. And, uh, I decided it was important for me to speak out and say, I don't pray, I don't believe in prayer, and I'm not going to pray. And so I did, and I didn't find anybody that cared. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I could get right in your face, and, and they'd say, well, okay, you know. Even my sponsor, he he would say, okay, okay, that's all, it's up to you. And then the next thing I know, he's talking to me about him praying. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, now, at my second meeting, a guy named Smokey Newton, Smokey Newton told me, uh, he said, how you doing? 
And I said, well, I'd like a drink. And he said, well, if you're an alcoholic, I'm sure that's true. And that may be true for a long time. But there's somebody in you that don't want to drink or you wouldn't be here at this AA meeting. And when I asked you, how are you? You get in touch with the guy inside of you that don't want to drink. And you say, well, I don't want to drink. Okay? Now, that was a big, that was a, a mammoth thing for me. Now, my sponsor said he would get up in the morning and he would ask God to keep him sober. Okay? I started getting up in the morning and getting in touch with the guy that isn't going to drink today. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I do that every morning. And I'm convinced now that God responds to that as if I was saying the words. It isn't, and that, Frank taught me that. Frank, you know, the smiley, uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful man in my life. And when I got in his face and said, I don't pray, he said, well, I never learned to pray effectively until I learned to meditate. Well, how do you meditate? He said, read step 11 in the 12 and 12. And uh, that was on Monday night. And on Friday night at our second meeting of the week, I saw him. I, he and I set up the meeting. And I saw him and he said, uh, what, did you read that? And I said, yes. What do you think? And I said, well, that's the St. Francis of Assisi prayer, which is just what I am not going to do. <laughs> and he says, is that all you got out of that? I said, Frank, that's all there is in it. <laughs> he had me come over to his house the next morning and over coffee and the 12 and 12, we went through step 11 starts out, prayer and meditation are our principal means of having contact with God. He said, you believe in God? I, yeah, I believe in God. I don't think it changes anything, but but I believe there is a God. And uh, he said, well, I don't personally want to miss our principal means of being conscious of God's presence. Then we got to the page. We went through the whole thing, but there's a paragraph in a couple pages that says, self-examination, meditation, and prayer, logically related and interwoven, form an unshakable foundation for life. And he says, now, if you feel like you have an unshakable foundation for life, well, of course, I don't feel that way. And then we go on, and, and a little later it says, we slowly repeat the St. Francis prayer. It doesn't say listening, but I say listening or looking for the deeper meaning of each word and phrase. And we went through this, and, and Frank said, now, we could go to the St. Francis of Assisi prayer the way Bill suggests, but I don't want you to do that. I want you to go through the first step, the first half of the first step. Now, in the, in the studio group, which is a beginner's group, nobody had your memorized stuff, but you, they just kept, you know, Chuck Ennis and those guys just took the things they were saying right out of the book. And pretty soon you were with them on that. So Frank knew that I knew the language of the big book for the first step. And he said, meditation, we're going to call meditation being conscious of what you want to be conscious of in the moment. Let's take, for example, the language of the first step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, let's just take the first half. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Then, be conscious of the meaning 
of the language. Alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control their drinking. Be conscious of that. And while you're doing that, be conscious of whether or not your experience fits that description. Alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control their drinking. The loss of control is characterized by an insane, obsessive belief each time we start to drink that somehow, some way, this time it's going to be different. This time we're going to control and enjoy our drinking. Coupled with that insane obsession is a physical reaction that manifests itself in the phenomenon of craving for more once you start to drink. He said, you have that? I got it. Does it fit you? Fits me. Alcoholics are restless, irritable, and discontented until they can once again experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes from taking a few drinks. Drinks which their insane obsession convinces them they can take with impunity. And when they succumb, as we all did, and the phenomenon of craving develops, we go through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolve never to do that again, and then we do it again and again and again. And over any considerable period of time, it gets worse, never better, which leads in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Now, he said, if your drinking experience fits AA's description of the alcoholic experience, then take a period of just being quiet and settle into the truth, fully conceding to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic. That is our first step in recovery. And while you're conscious in your innermost self, also know that if you drink again or use mind-altering chemicals again, in a very short time, you're going to be back into pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Now, we would set I would sit quietly and know that, not have any language, but just know that truth. Now, Frank said, at the end of your meditation of knowing that you're an alcoholic and you can't drink, be conscious of how your life has changed since you came to AA. Now, Frank knew that I'd been demoted He knew that Pat was going to leave me, that I was hopelessly in debt, and that I'd stolen equipment. He also knew by this time that every one of these problems was resolved. And he said to me, be conscious of how the things that brought you to AA have been taken care of, and be conscious that you had very little to do with it. See that it just seemed to happen. Lucky breaks. <laughs> Stuff like the sponsor I picked. You know, the, the fence had taken off with the money and the equipment. Uh, the sponsor that I picked, at one when I told Kenny about the equipment, he said, who was the fence? And I told him, I said, I don't know how to get a hold of him. Well, Kenny and this guy had been in high school together at one time, in fact, that they had shared an apartment when they were between wives. And Kenny came to AA, and the other guy just kept digging him a hole and finally died. But uh, uh, I never saw a divine order in that. I just thought, damn, you know, I'm really lucky here. Uh, 
that and the fact that I wasn't lucky because I had to go further in debt to get the equipment and uh, uh, and I took it back but but it was marvelous you know but I never wasn't conscious of God in this at all it never even occurred to me I don't think uh, but uh, okay so I'm conscious of this and then Frank said if you look up the word grateful, it's a feeling, it's a good feeling that comes when something bad is taken away from your life or something good is added to your life. That good feeling is gratitude. And if you feel that, one prayer would be, thank you God. Then he said, this is not a glass this is not a table. This is not a podium. It's a lectern. Uh, uh, and, uh, but, he said, those are words. Glasses, word, water's word, tables, word, lectern. And these things aren't words. They're what they are. Thank you, God, is just words. If you're feeling grateful, just let that be your prayer. And occasionally when you're meditating and being grateful, a feeling of goodness will start right above your ankles and come up your body, go with goosebumps out the back of your hand and the back of your neck. And he said, when that happens, please know that that's my God saying, I felt your gratitude and you're welcome. Now, I learned, that's the way I learned to pray, was to feel grateful. Now, I had anxiety attacks well into my second year of sobriety. And and uh, uh, Frank and I went to a noon meeting. It was a very special meeting of old-timers. Uh, Chuck C. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of old, old timers came to that, and Frank took me. And, uh, uh, a guy named Ken Schoenlaw said one day, you know, I was reading this article about the effects of alcohol on the body, and alcohol doesn't create a good feeling. Alcohol is a sedative drug. It sedates bad feelings. And once those are sedated, there's an inherent good feeling there that you experience. One of re relaxation, and uh, it just so happens that that is achieved in a manner analogous to burning the nerves numb. They're numb for about two hours, but they're burned for 12. So you're more agitated after two hours, but we knew how to handle that. You just keep drinking. You know, just keep numbing it over a long period of time, and then you'll have convulsive seizures. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, on the way on the way back to work, uh, Frank Frank picked me up at work, and then he dropped me back off at work. And he said, uh, "I said, God, that sound that makes a lot of sense to me." And he said, that's to me too. Now, the next Tuesday, I had an anxiety attack at work. I mean, I just, you know, by an anxiety attack, you have to breathe in a paper bag. You, you just are immobilized. It's, it's close to insanity. But, and, and I left the meeting I was in and called Frank. And Frank said, i tell you what I'll do, Howard. I'll say the serenity prayer with you. I said, damn, Frank, I, I need some help. <laughs> you know what I think about prayer. And he said, okay, but you called me. I didn't call you. Do you know, we say in these situations the serenity prayer. Do you want to do that? Now, 
When we said, God, grant me the serenity, my head always said, when we was holding hands, in the, my head would always say, God, don't change things because people pray. That was just my response to any time I prayed. But now, there's an additional response. And this was, God don't have to change anything to give you serenity. You have serenity. You're just tapped into anger. You're tapped into to fear. The courage to change the things we can. You have courage. You're just tapped into anger for your strength. And by the end of the prayer, I had the wisdom to know the difference, and the anxiety attack had left. It was over. I said to Frank, well, my God, that worked that time. I said, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if God changed something or the prayer did. Now, I later thought the prayer aligned me with the truth of what Ken Shunglaw said, and that if I, you know, the anxiety shuts me off from the sunlight of the spirit. Anyway, I decided it was a human intellectual thing, but no big deal. But I have not had an anxiety attack since I had that experience with the serenity prayer. I just haven't. I've been anxious, but I just think my anxiety is at a, a normal level commensurate with the circumstances. Uh, now, I didn't look on that as, you know, I looked on it as important, but I re- rationalized it as being an intellectual thing rather than any kind of divine thing. And uh, But I started meditating on the first step and feeling grateful. And that always worked in terms of having a sense of well-being. Then... I'd be in the corner, and uh, and I I couldn't get out, and 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 it might occur to me, or somebody might say, "Are you meditating?" God, no, I forgot. You know, I I haven't been meditating, and I'd start meditating again, and I would be better. And uh, this was well into my second year of sobriety. And uh, I got myself in a corner, and then I'd start meditating, and and I would feel better again. And then I'd just one day not meditate, and then I wouldn't think of meditating for days or weeks. And uh, I was in the 12 and 12, uh, I think it's in page 75 now, and it says, it used to be page 77, but they changed the book. Um, we finally learn that we have to stop using our higher power as some kind of a bush lig pinch hitter. God isn't something that you can depend on just in, just respond to when you're having problems, but has to be in the game all the time. And uh, I thought, damn, I haven't been meditating. And I made a commitment to start on the 1st of October, 1974. Now, there's a guy named Ram Das. His real name is Richard Alpert. He was the head of the psychology department at Harvard. One of his subordinates was Timothy Leary. And Tim was was very convinced that drugs were the solution to all psychological problems, and and uh, he experimented a great deal with LSP. Richard Alpert, his boss, participated in that, and they both got fired. Now, Richard, Harvard fired both of them, but Richard argues that he was just getting ready to make a statement that LSD is unreliable. You cannot use it as a medicine. It always has effect, but you can take the same amount at different times and have a different effect. Sometimes you can take it and you just see the shadow of water in that cup. 
And you notice how important that is. Why, this is the most important, you know, I mean, it's fabulously important. Other times you can take the same amount and look and the cup melts. You know, well, this is unreliable stuff. And and, uh, Richard was going to announce that when they fired him and he went to India and and he he ran into a guru. Now, two or three nights before he talked to the guru, he had been standing behind his car on a dark, clear, moonless night, and he was looking at the stars, and in his head, his mother said something to him. And in his head, he said something back to his mother, and they had this special conversation, which he knew was just a fantasy. And when he met the guru, several days later, the guru said, you know, when you were standing behind your car two nights ago, and your mom said this to you, and you said that to, you know, uh, Ram Dass, I mean, Richard Alpert was stunned with this, and he became a devotee of, of, uh, of, of this guru. And that, he gave him the name Ram Dass. And, uh, and Ram Dass became an author of American books on Eastern spiritual practices. And the thing about this guy that struck me was he really knows the Western psyche. And he really knew the Eastern uh, spiritual practices. And he was able to write very good books. One of them is A Journey of Awakening. Uh, a, a guidebook for meditators. And I read that book, and uh, and he said, pick a reasonable period of time to try meditation, and I picked a half hour. And picked then a reasonable period of time to meditate with this one practice. Pick a practice, and he lists a bunch of ways of doing it. One of them is walking and marching, and he says, don't go against yourself. If you're sedentary, then sit in a, a position and, and be conscious very quietly. But if you're active and you don't go against yourself, find one that fits you. Then that will grow from there, from the inside out. Probably an inside job. And uh, uh, But I'm sedentary. <laughs> you know, you'll find me on no ball team. And I... Uh, <laughs> Now, I also, uh, there was an ex-priest who later became my sponsor, uh, named John Haley, and he passed away, and Frank passed away, but, but John, I was talking to him about meditation, he was, I heard him talk about it, and I said, well, my mind's too active to meditate. My mind is just like the squirrel cage, and, and he said, oh, I believe that. And he said, for you to sit down, I don't think you could sit down and focus that mind for 30 minutes. But I think you could sit there. That's a very important thing. If I'm going to meditate for 30 minutes, first I've got to sit there. And whether I can meditate or not, I'm going to sit there. And that's how I got started. My mind... now. Now I was no longer doing the steps, but now I was going to do a mantra. Um, 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 um. Do that for 30 minutes, for six months. <laughs> I went from the 1st of October to the 1st of April doing that. Didn't know what it meant. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, you, you just keep doing this. You don't necessarily make the, the sound. Uh, but in your head, that you're repeating that mantra, and then your mind wanders. And as soon as you see it's wandered, let that be all right, thank you for sharing, and then come back <laughs> to the mantra. And uh, uh, you develop, you know, the big book on page 88 says, 
We are an undisciplined lot, but we let God discipline us in this simple way we've just described, and and that's the way that uh, I uh, I started developing a discipline. And after six months, I think I changed the rum 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 for thirty minutes a day for six months. I went through a series of these things before I actually started meditating on the breath which turns out to be the one that I might have started with to start with because it was when I started doing the breath that I noticed changes of significance in my life. Now, there are always changes. I was always getting inputs. I, uh, uh, I was one morning uh, going to work. There was a, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, pressure at work and my plan for the day was to be patient, tolerant, kindly and loving at work. I'm driving to work I come behind this car and the light is red and uh, come on, all my life as a baby elephant I know when the light's red you stop, that's no problem. The light turned green and they didn't go. And all my life, my routine had been to roll down the window, stick my head out the window and say, Hey, up there, that's as green as it gets. What you waiting on? (laughs) This morning, lifetime situation, And right before I start my routine, a voice says, Howard, you're really feeling good this morning. Why give that up? Because the color of a light changed. I don't care. I'm not that smart. You know. (laughs) That's a powerful thought for me to have. And... uh, uh, those things happened regularly, and I know it was as a result of meditation. Uh, and AA and the other stuff we were learning. And, uh, but meditation was a huge help. Uh, and I went through this series of stuff. Now, my wife and I have been married for a long time, even then. We were married 20 years when we came to AA. And she believes things that in her mind, there's, it's just truth, and, and she's not interested in the real truth, which I try to explain to her. And this particular morning, she was telling me that I was tearing up her car's transmission because I was in third rather than overdrive. And uh, as soon as I pulled down the freeway, it started winding up, and and she got, she's, you're in the wrong gear, you're tearing up the transmission. And uh, my head starts on this litany. You don't even know how I make a living. I'm the manager of a technical sector. I have people working for me that design transmissions. I don't know anything about them myself. <laughs> but neither do you. And I'm going through this litany. And there's a love song in our lives that perfectly describe Pat and I's relationship through junior high and high school. And that was, I was deeply in love with her and I never told her. And she was engaged to this other guy And uh, when we got out of school. Now, the lyrics of, okay, so I disengage. The reason I can do that is because I have practiced it with mantra, I have practiced it with breathing, and I have developed a discipline so that when I realize my mind is over here, I can disengage from that. And I can engage the lyrics. You gave your hand to me and you said hello, and I could hardly speak, my heart was beating so. And anyone could tell, you think you know me well, but you don't know me. No, you don't know the one who dreams of you each night and longs to kiss your lips and longs to hold you tight. To you, I'm just a friend 
that's all I've ever been, but you don't know me. For I never knew the art of making love, though my heart aches with love for you. Afraid and shy, I let my chance go by, the chance that you might love me too. You gave your hand to me and you said goodbye. I watched you walk away beside that lucky guy. Oh no, you'll never know the one who loves you so, because you don't know me. Now, when I say that, even to you today, I get goosebumps and I am in love. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I married this wonderful girl who's the mother of our children and is the best mother. And what do I care what she thinks about the transmission in a (laughs) Honda Accord? I mean, how important is that? You know, now that's a major, major change in my life that I'm able to do that. It's a really major change that I want to do it. But you get the discipline. I think the big book's right. We, we get a discipline to do things. And then, and, and then we get a choice. Before, I never had a choice. I, I would just go off on this stuff. It wouldn't make any difference if it was Pat or ever who in the hell it was. Pat used to say all the way through school, why do you get in trouble? Why do you get in trouble? Well, I know why, because of everybody else. But the reason was I could not, did not, and would not, not go off on people. You know, if you get in the crowd, like Disneyland, you know, if you go to Disneyland and you're going to watch the Christmas parade, it's cra- I make a prediction. Somebody's going to bump into you. <laughs> now, you can just kind of be grown up and expect that. Or you can straighten them out. And I always straighten people out, you know, and, and so I'm in trouble all the time. Well, this meditation, along with the other steps, gives you something else that you can do consciously. Or it does me that that's a big help. Plus, I get interesting input. Uh, I, I, but before I got my promotion to my career goal, I thought I had it, and I didn't have it. I couldn't get the job because well, for an organizational problem, but it was I wasn't getting the promotion. I got a raise, but I didn't get the promotion. And uh, I know my boss said, "Come on, you're working for money." Well, my ego ain't. My ego wants the job title, and I haven't lost my ego yet. I want the job title, and. In my meditation, at the end of the meditation, the thought came to me, the pain you're going through over this disappointment is driven by your wanting something that you don't believe you can have. There is no other source driving the pain. It is you all by yourself. Seeing that, I could disengage from that and accept that I wasn't going to get the the, uh, promotion, and then I got it. Uh, So, I, uh, uh, now, there's a, Ram Dass' book is a good book. There's another one that's uh, number two, maybe number one now, called An Open Heart by the Dalai Lama. And uh, the first half of that book, maybe a little past the half, is just priceless for me, and it sounds like the AA program. After that, he talks about stuff that I never heard of, don't understand, I mean, it gets pretty deep. But uh, go through that, up through the chapter on meditation, and it's great. And one of the things he said which very closely, I think, par- parallels what uh, uh, Bill Wilson had, except 
The Dalai Lama says there are two types of meditation in his practice. One he calls analytical meditation. The other is settled meditation. Analytical meditation is just that. You analyze your spiritual practice in order for you to decide whether this is valid or invalid for you. If it's invalid, set it aside. But if it is valid, then it becomes a very solid part of your spiritual practice, similar to Bill Wilson's language, an unshakable foundation. His analysis is similar to self-examination. Uh, and meditation is always being conscious of what you want to be conscious of. I think prayer is aligning my consciousness with the truth that I experience in my life. The truth of the goodness in my life rather than the badness, which the only bad thing that happens to me is it's not my way. You know? So, so now that's, uh, that I have practiced all of these things, but the one that I do now is, is both the big, the, the 12 and 12, it's a combination of the 12 and 12 and, uh, uh, the Dalai Lama's analytical and settled meditation. Now, an example of, uh, Okay, uh, so we go through the first step. There, there, there's three, three halves. The, uh, there are three halves to the first step. I'm an alcoholic and I fully concede to my innermost self. Two is, I fully concede, two is, two is, I fully concede to my innermost self that I'm a victim of the insane delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. That's insane. I lack the power to do it. Now, uh, I've heard people, we've all heard people say, the big book's all we need, or the program is in the big book. And, and I was in this big book thumping group and I told Chuck Ennis, our, our oldest guy, I said, well, I was at a step study meeting the other night, and the 12 and 12 says, and he said, Howard, don't get caught up in that 12 and 12. Bill was on acid when he wrote that. <laughs> Bill wrote that to make money. Now, nobody regretted Bill the money, because he could have gone out in the stock business and made a fortune. And he devoted himself to stabilizing AA so it would always be there for every alcoholic who wanted it. He said, we were grateful that he got the money. But don't get caught up in that 12 and 12. Well, I kind of didn't get caught up in the 12 and 12. And, and that became my baby elephant belief. And, and then I read in Pass It On, it has a nice section on Bill and the 12 and 12. And it says, Bill had 15 years from when he wrote the big book where he could watch alcoholics come into AA, get sober, stay sober, but remain angry, anxious, fearful, and depressed long after the high tide of active alcoholism had receded. And that he wrote Father Dowling and said, my reason, I've really picked a tough job here for, uh, for myself in writing essays on the 12 step. And that is, I mustn't change the steps, but I must deepen and broaden their application in the alcoholic's life. And then I kind of went back over and I found that third half of the first step in the first page 
of step one on the 12 and 12, our admissions of our personal powerlessness become bedrock upon which we build happy, comfortable lives. Well, one of the things I have learned to do when I find something I don't agree with or that I don't identify is to meditate. And what I didn't agree with was I am personally powerless. Now, I know I lack the power. Lack of power is my dilemma, but I am not personally powerless. And I had the big book open right in front of me on page 45. <laughs> where it says, lack of power is our dilemma, and I have meditated, just sat quietly and kind of listened for an answer, which never seems to come that often during my meditation period, but when my timer went off, my head said, well, I'm not powerless. I have the power to decide to pick this up. And having decided, I have the power to pick it up. Let's pick it up. The voice said, that's right, Howard. Now, pick it up with your vision. Don't pick it up with your hands. Put your vision around it and pick it up. Well, I can't do that. That's silly. Well, give yourself the power to do that. Well, I can't give myself the power to do that. No, and you didn't give yourself the power to decide to pick it up with your hands. And you didn't give yourself the power to pick it up with your hands because you are personally powerless. And whatever power you have has to have come to you from some other source of power. Now, that's the bedrock upon which I can look at the second step. And my meditation takes me to that bedrock. And then I can look at the second step. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Bill Wilson says, none of us will ever be able to fully comprehend or define that power which is God. But that we should be open to the possible existence of a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. Having all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence, manifesting precise law, order, harmony, and goodness throughout the material world and life as we see it. Bill also says, look at what the religious people find and, and find that same thing from religion. But in this one place, he says, science tells us so and we have no reason to doubt it. And I chose to look at what science tells us. And in my meditation, I focus on some finely tuned, and there's an endless number of finely tuned processes underlying the material world and life as we see it that are convincing proof to me of the presence of an all-powerful guiding creative intelligence. Our vision being principally interacting with light from Andromeda with the naked eye over Light traveling at 187,000 miles per second came over 2 million light years away and is principally interactive with your vision so that you see the light. I don't care. Somebody write a song, I see the light. Uh, some country guy. Uh, a <laughs> bad country song. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. I think about, I'm, I'm conscious of those things. Now, I generally end up, okay, take a breath in. Be conscious of the breath coming in. And at the top of the breath, be conscious of where the breath stops coming in and the interval of when it starts coming out. Then at the bottom of the breath, the interval and the breath coming in.
Now, continue to do that, but know that the breath coming in is air and that your lungs filter oxygen out of that air into your bloodstream. And the molecules of oxygen bond to iron in your hemoglobin, which is pumped out to the capillary veins in your body. Oxidation takes place. The oxygen is converted to carbon dioxide, and the nutrients are released to give your cells new life right now. Nutrients from the food you ate, blood from the water you drank. Your body is principally interactive in the most detailed way to give you new life with each breath. You breathe out carbon dioxide into the air. All the plants absorb the air. They filter the carbon dioxide out of the air out through its body to give its cells new life. And it converts carbon dioxide back into oxygen and releases it into the air. Be conscious now of a mantra with each breath coming in. Have your mind tell your consciousness, the power of God is within me. Because it is only God's power, the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, having all-powerful, guiding, creative intelligence, manifesting precise law, order, harmony, and goodness throughout the material world and life as you see it. The power of God is within me, the grace of God surrounds me. The power of God is within me as truth. Not just words, but the truth of the words. Bring those into your consciousness and the grace of God surrounds you. Not just in this immediate area, but throughout the total universe, every aspect of all being. And you're principally interactive with it. Because of divine order, I think. And divine order is defined. The pervasive presence of all the power and intelligence necessary for every circumstance and event in the universe to unfold into a right result. And uh, now... When, and that would not only be, when, when we say life as we see it, it isn't just breathing and seeing, but life as we see it includes circumstances and events of life. Includes the character and quality of circumstances and events of life. And your participation is to be convinced of its goodness. And once you're convinced of that, you're at step three. Make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand it. As a pervasive presence of goodness in your life. God. And then when I address God in the third step prayer, I am conscious of who I'm talking to. And I'm talking to a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. There's no place in the process that requires God's intervention because his presence is seamless, endless, always on the inside. And it is an inside job. I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thy will. Then I stop and know as truth that everything in life I have ever needed has been drawn into my life 
And I have been given the power and the knowledge to interact with those circumstances and events, practicing patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love, and to be conscious of life's unfolding goodness. Knowing that, being conscious of that, takes, re- removes me from the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Then I stop and know the spirit of the universe does not experience a problem, a difficulty, or an unresolved circumstance. Those are products of my trying, my thinking, and my trying to get something done that I lack the power to do. Now, if I trust the spirit's experience only of order, harmony, and goodness. And the spirit experiences it in love. Of course, it's perfect, and therefore it loves it. Knowing that takes away my difficulty that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power. Thy love, and I take the time to love my life, starting with herself, our kids, the program, my life. I love my life because the Holy Spirit loves my life. And I am convinced that when I love my life, I'm face to face with the Spirit's love for my life. Of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life, what would God's way of life be? Perhaps, in creating the universe, he graced it with his spirit for the goodness of his creation and his creatures. So my way of life is best if I am of service to God and to his creatures for their goodness. May I do thy will always. Amen. Going through that analysis, I then settle and be conscious of the sense of well-being, the sense of ease and comfort that I get because I'm conscious of the truth of my life being in God's care. Now, throughout the day, I try to add five more meditations on the third step prayer. Takes me about six. I picked that up in Egypt, where when whistles blow and bells ring, these people hit their knees and their head down, and they become conscious of God's presence. And And that's really a strengthening thing for me to take that extra time and bring my consciousness back to this truth. Meditation isn't important in the big book. It only says, thy will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts that must go with you constantly. And at the bottom of the page, it says, uh, we know better, uh, we're going to bring up prayer and meditation. Better men than us have been using it constantly. I mean, hell, that's probably 5% of the time. Uh, <laughs> when do you do this in the program? Well, on awakening, as you plan your day, when you're agitated and doubtful, We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show. And when we retire at night, except for that, it's not anything that we're called upon to do in in the program. Uh, (laughs) And uh, I'm amazed and, and I'm so grateful. I know you guys are too. For the Frank Jewels that come into our lives and help us just for fun and for free to teach us to do the things that we learn to do that 
really enrich our lives. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be asked to come and to share because I I get a sense of well-being from, from going over this with you. I don't know if you do or not, but I do. And, I'm, you know, anyway, thank you guys very much for being here. I love you, and uh, let's have a great weekend. Thank you.